From September 11th to the Great Recession, from Katrina to government shutdowns, small businesses have been battling stresses and shocks. Through grit to innovation, they have sustained local economies with their resilience. Now, they face an unprecedented threat, COVID-19. As Congress scrambles to provide aid, coronavirus economic relief packages are overlooking millions of micro businesses. Many of these businesses are owned by people of color, veterans, immigrants, and others who operate in low and moderate income communities. During the best of times, they face hardships in gaining access to the resources needed to thrive, grow, and hire. Their remarkable innovation to provide economic freedom for their families is on full display. What will you do to support the heartbeat of the nation's economy? Good morning. I am Gustavo Lasala. As board member of AEO and CEO of People Fund, it is an honor to welcome you to the third day of AEO 2020 conference. I wish I could say, welcome to Texas, which is home of People Fund. However, instead of saying welcome to a couple of thousands of microfinance entrepreneurs, practitioners, and partners to Houston, Texas, today we are saying welcome to tens of thousands of people that have joined this digital conference from all around the world. In the context of the current pandemic, this is a testament, not just to the hard work of a lot of people, and kudos to Coney and the rest of the team in AEO, but it's also a testament to human ingenuity. What a great example of overcoming adversity. In talking about adversity, COVID-19 reminded all of us in a brutal way that we share one planet and we are all in this together. During this crisis, we have witnessed how the words, I can't breathe, took a different meaning, pointing to the core of our social divide. Regardless of race, national origin, background, or political affiliation, those words remind us of all the things that we as part of a global community need to work together to resolve. As microfinance practitioners, we deal every day with small business owners that do not have access to the resources that they need to start or grow their businesses. 
Their businesses cannot breathe that way. And as you will know, most of these small business owners are minorities, low-income people, women, and veterans. The panels today are about equity access to entrepreneurial support. I'm sure you will find them thought-provoking and inspiring. But before going there, let me share with you a bit of the work of People Fund you in the crisis. We took action early on, focusing on the humanitarian aspects of the crisis first. We seeded our COVID-19 relief fund with capital readily available, and we started providing relief capital and payment accommodations to those businesses that needed it the most. We established partnerships that allowed us to offer capital with no interest and no payments for six months, and in some areas, thanks to the support of local foundations and partners, we've been able to offer total payment relief for six months to businesses that were in serious distress. We also offered technical assistance, helping businesses establish and, and implement their own disaster response programs. We have helped in two months more clients that we have planned to help for the entire 2020. All big endeavors start small. And it is through hard work, ingenuity, and hope for a better future that those become reality. We have a huge task ahead. Work together and do our part to leave future generations a better world. So I'm going to leave you with this. What will you do to make it happen? Enjoy the day. Welcome to week two of AEO's digital conference, Resilient Small Businesses Strengthening Local Economies. For those of you joining us for the first time, from conversations on women and wealth to conversations with city leaders and small businesses, we've been busy. But don't worry, we've just gotten started. Because although we're not in Houston, with a low of 74 and a high of 90, we're still committed to our brand promise to help you innovate faster, partner smarter, and execute better. Want the VIP experience that allows you to access live chats, Q&As with panelists, and gives you a chance at amazing giveaways like Tim LaHandy, who won in iPad? Well, go to aeoworks.org and select conference to register now. Lastly, engage us on social media by giving us a like, retweet, or join the conversation by using the hashtag Revitalize Main Street. And now for our first conversation, a keynote on designing a new system, equitable entrepreneurship with Stephen DeBerry. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen DeBerry, and I'm, I'm glad to join you this morning. I had a very elegant presentation laid out uh, after connecting with Connie and getting prepared for this, but then America started happening. So I've thrown that away, and I'm just going to talk to you this morning. So I'll beg your forgiveness. Uh, many of this is bedraggled, but Given the nature of what's going on, it occurs to me that what was going to be another important discussion uh, is now likely to become a historical document. So I want to start out by putting the minutes in the book and just 
taking note of what's happening at this moment. It's June 2nd, 2020. For me on the left coast, it's a little after 10 in the morning. There have been protests in over 350 cities in the United States. No state in the union has gone without protest. There's activity in places we wouldn't normally suspect, North Dakota, South Dakota, Alaska, Hawaii. The entire union has erupted. The National Guard has been deployed to 23 states. The president has threatened to activate the Insurrection Act and activate the military and turn it against U.S. citizens. There's been a global response, Canada, Mexico, Poland, Palestine, Brazil, France, the UK, Syria. The whole world is paying attention. The whole world is standing with us. The vast majority of these protests have been peaceful. They've also been infiltrated by elements that want to see destruction in our communities. At the end of the day, I want to ask why. Why is all this happening? The answer might be because an officer, Derek Chauvin, committed a murder that we all saw on television. Then you ask yourself, well, why? Why did he do that? And the answer might be that, well, it was because George Floyd was arrested. And then you keep pulling the thread and you ask why. And the answer is ultimately that Mr. Floyd was accused of using a counterfeit $20 bill. And so we wake up this morning in the context of global disruption on top of the pandemic that's happening. And when you ask why and you pull a thread and you go all the way back to the ultimate source, you realize that the answer is all of this disruption is happening over 20 bucks. I think it's important to put that in context. That is not law. That is not justice. That is vanity expression of power. And that vanity expression of power rhymes with the kind of vanity expressions of power that we've seen for centuries. If you go to the lynching memorial in Montgomery, Alabama, you will see plaques that memorialize similar vanities, like Mary Turner, who was lynched in 1918 for complaining about the recent lynching of her husband or Frank Dodd, who was lynched in 1916 for annoying a white woman, or John Stoner, who was lynched in 1909 for suing the white man who killed his cow. I'm thinking this morning about the fire last time. When I was 19 years old, I was a freshman at UCLA. It was springtime. And the verdict for Rodney King had just come down. Several police had been caught on a camcorder beating this man to within an inch of his life. He survived, unlike Mr. Floyd. But it was the first time in my lifetime that we had clear, visible evidence of the vanity expressions of power that the police had been unleashing on most of us. But almost no one would believe us. And finally, we saw the evidence and we fought that we would find justice. That didn't happen, and it was the last time I saw my city burn in the way I'm seeing it now. I was a freshman at UCLA. I was in Hedrick Hall on the third floor. I remember distinctly because I was on crutches. I had just broken my hip in a track race, and I remember how concerned I was because you know, if this riot spread to my campus, I wasn't able to flee because I had a broken hip. I was on crutches. For me, that was the fire last time. It was different then. It was contained to Los Angeles. It wasn't spread all over the United States or around the world. It was really broadly understood as a black thing. Folks talk about uh, this happening to the black community. The 
feeling it felt very disconnected. And I compare that fire last time to the current situation, the fire this time. And I'm older now, I'm 46 years old. I'd say I'm old enough to know better and young enough to know what's up. I've spent my life since the King incident trying to understand our social and economic landscape. The difference this time is we have much more infrastructure to work with. We've got the Black Lives Matter global network. We've got organizations like Color of Change, which has held countless corporations to account. We've got amazing research to build from, like the Black Futures Lab and their Black Census, Black Census which is the most exhaustive uh, census of Black life in the U.S., and certainly the tapestry work that has been done by AEO. We have a set of tools at our disposal to respond in a more coordinated and strategic way, a, a breadth of tools and specificity that we arguably have never had before. Another thing that's different about the fire this time is it's not only being understood as a black thing. That the protests are active right now in every state in the union is testament to that fact, that the long list of countries that I mentioned and many, many others are on that list is testament to that fact. I also want to share a couple of personal notes about the fire this time for me, both of which came up in the last 24 hours. The first came this morning. I posted a note on social media. It was a simple question. It said, Black men, when was the first time you had a gun pulled on you by the police? My answer was, I was 16. I thought I'd get a few responses. I was just curious. And I woke up this morning to a very, very long list of responses from Black men, also some Black women and others, who shocked me into the realization that, and I don't have the specific count. You can all go to my Facebook page and see what's actually there. But there are probably on the order of about 150 responses. And like me, many folks responded with just a number. This is when it happened to me. I don't have the specific number because it was easier to count the number of people who had not had a gun pulled on them by police. That number is four. At least 50, probably closer to 100 who answered in one way or another, that this is an experience that they had. This issue that we're dealing with is more pervasive than even I understood until this morning. And I'm someone who focuses on this, pays attention, I've dedicated much of my life to it. Even I didn't understand how deeply this has plagued our society. The other very personal thing that I wanna share is a conversation I had with my daughter, who is 11 years old. We were on a walk yesterday, and she said, I'll be so excited if I live past this. She said it in the unassuming way that an 11 year old describes the world. It was so heavy because the weight of her perspective is so true. And I wanted to act like that wasn't a rational perspective, but unfortunately it is. And that is why in this moment, in ways like never before, things have to change. They have to change. And that's what we're here to talk about today. We're, talk, we're here to talk about doing things in a different way. I wanna tell a quick story. 
about how we could do things differently and, and one that I hope is relevant to the context of this AEO discussion and relevant to small business in our society. The discussion is about the game Monopoly and it stars the same daughter that I just told you about. Her name's Cleo, my other daughter, Ella, and uh, my wife and their mom, Christine. We were playing Monopoly and as you do in Monopoly, you buy a property and you try to compete with each other. This was a few years ago. So my, my youngest daughter at the time was probably six, maybe seven. She had just learned how to read. She was the least sophisticated of us. And so she, of course, uh, went out first while we were playing Monopoly. And she started crying because she didn't want to be left out. And so, of course, I'm her dad. I said to her, uh, take the property you have and you come sit with me. You don't have to go out. We'll play together. And so she did. She came and sat with me and we kept playing and it was another five or 10 minutes. And then her older sister went out and the same thing happened. She started crying. And of course, I don't want this sorrow in my home and I love my kids. So I told my other daughter, you come sit next to me. And now I had Cleo on one side and Ella on the other. And I looked up and saw the reality that I certainly didn't try to construct, which is that it's the three of us playing against mommy. And that is not a way to keep a happy home. It was in that moment that I realized something really important, which was that we had been combining our properties, the girls and I, we were set up to compete against mommy and we could win the whole thing. But I also realized that, wait a minute, we own all the property in this game. And Maybe since I don't want to see my daughters cry, I don't want to see my wife cry, I want this to be a joyful experience. Maybe we're playing this game the wrong way. And so I said, hey, you guys, why don't we play against the bank instead of each other? And I have no slides, but for those who are interested, you could follow up with me. I actually devise an equation that can help you understand exactly how many laps it takes if the players don't compete against each other to deplete and own the entire bank. Since you get $200 every time you pass go, it's literally a matter of time if you choose to collaborate in this way before you own the entire bank. And the point that came out of that for me There were two. One was that love is a competitive advantage. If I didn't care about my kids and my wife the way I do, it never would have occurred to me to try to change the way we play the game. The other point that I took from that is there's a difference between innovation and optimization. Optimization is playing the game of Monopoly and buying the best properties and extracting the most rents and beating the folks you're playing against as quickly as you can. Innovation is realizing that you love the people in the game and doing what it takes, employing all of your creativity to maximize that joy. And those decisions that are driven by that kind of love, that's innovation, which is in contrast to op optimization. Love is a competitive advantage. And I think today we need to have conversations that are marinated and grounded and powered by love because love is a competitive advantage. It's the source of the innovation that we need. And no people in the U.S. have had to be more innovative as a matter of survival than Black people. And therefore, there is no better source of innovation in this moment than Black people. So what does that look like? If we play the game differently in reality, it's not a metaphor, it's not monopoly. To me, what that innovation looks like is a fully activated philanthropic economy. 
U.S. Foundation endowments are about $850 billion in aggregate assets. The social contract we have with these organizations is that as long as they pay out 5%, they remain tax exempt, and those assets can grow without paying tax, and that's the fair trade. We need to fully activate those endowments. That means the 95% that's sitting in those endowments need to be aligned with investments that are improving our society. Those dollars need to be fueling the kind of love-backed innovation that I'm talking about. We need to understand that the resource base is much more vast than just philanthropy, which we tend to lean on to do the work. But do you realize, I think precious few people talk about this. I had never heard anyone mention it until a small group of us started talking about this a little over a year ago. There are on the order of 2 million people of color in the United States who are millionaires. So let's do some simple math. 2 million times 1 million is $2 trillion. So said differently, people of color in the United States, in aggregate, are more than twice the size of philanthropy. And so it's high time to rid ourselves of this notion that we are without resources and the autonomy uh, and the agency to do what we need to do from an economic perspective. In a 20 trillion little rough, give or take, $20 trillion GDP economy, 70% of our economic production is consumer spending. That's not 1%. That's not billionaires. That's you and me. That's everyday people buying milk and gas and tires and TVs and bread and the things that we consume and produce to make our society what it is. It's actually about us. The thing that's different about this situation, unlike the fire last time, is that, as evidenced by what we see in the streets, Black folks are not alone in this. This isn't like the aftermath of the Rodney King situation. And there is a broad willingness and, indeed, a desire, active desire, on the part of many white folks who've been standing on the sidelines who are now stepping up and saying, I, I see the problem in ways that I didn't before. I want to be part of the solution. And importantly, I am looking for your guidance. I realize that this is a time for me to lead by following. It is not a time for me to step in front of you, people of color, black people, and tell you what you need. We understand and we respect that you have that understanding for yourself and that you are self-determined and that we are prepared to follow your lead. I've never experienced that. I don't know anyone that has, and it's happening now. These are the kinds of conversations that I think we're going to have today. I admire, without exception, everyone that's on the panel coming immediately after this and everyone that will be part of the discussion for the rest of this day. It's a powerful moment, loved ones. And I pray that we take best advantage of it because this is not a drill. There is no fire next time. Only the flames that are burning right now. And those flames will not be extinguished until we find justice. Thank you. Our communities need help like never before. And Wells Fargo employees are assisting millions of customers across America through fee waivers and payment deferrals. Helping people stay in their homes through mortgage payment relief efforts. And donating $175 million to help hundreds of local organizations provide food and other critical needs. When you need us, Wells Fargo is here to help.
Good afternoon. My name is My name is Gary Cunningham. And I am the board chair of AEO. And I am also the president of Prosperity Now. And I come to you after that uh, fantastic, eloquent statement uh, by my good friend Steve DeBerry, uh, who reminded us we are in a moment. We are in a moment of transformation. We are in a moment of change. Uh, we can't just talk about these issues of entrepreneurship, uh, of people of color in a vacuum. We have to talk about it within the context of what's going on. And historically, people of color uh, have not been able to participate fully uh, in our uh, capital systems and structures that would allow them to uh, have the power, the economic power, of creating businesses and opportunities in their community. Uh, Steve reminds us that this uh, possibility of something different happening is right in front of us. And it's in front of us in part because people are sacrificing their lives, like Mr. Floyd, like some of the young people that are uh, protesting uh, today, uh, and that we're in a different place in time. Today, we're going to have a conversation uh, about what needs to happen and what needs to happen differently in terms of uh, building the infrastructure that's needed or a system for equitable entrepreneurship. And today, I'm joined by uh, my good friends and colleagues, at, Abigail Golden Vasquez of the Aspen Institute uh, Latino and Society Program, uh, Anthony Perry, uh, a well known author uh, and friend uh, from the Brookings Institute, and Phil Gaskins uh, of the UE Marion Kaufman Foundations. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Gary. Good to be here. <laughs> so, uh, Steve DeBerry really set us up. Uh, for a deep conversation. Uh, typically, I think we'd be talking about the, the three main issues or areas that people of color and other entrepreneurs face is access to capital, access to markets, and access to trusted guidance. Uh, I would argue that that conversation, while important, isn't good enough in this moment, uh, and that we need to really dig deep today. And so I'm going to be counting on you each uh, to bring bring it on, bring it fully to the table with regards to what needs to happen next. Uh, I've been working on these issues. Uh, I, I need to fully disclose I'm from Minneapolis. I grew up on that corner on 38th in, in Chicago where uh, Mr. Floyd was murdered. Uh, and so it really, and I've worked on these issues. I was part of the first task force on police review in Minneapolis many years ago and have worked on these issues ever since. And it's disheartening and disappointing to see what we see happening. And my heart and my prayers and my condolences go to the Floyd family and all of those that are suffering because of this tragic situation that we find ourselves in. Um, I would like to start by uh, asking the question from your perspectives. Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, Abigail Golden Vasquez uh, to ask you, what is your perspective on this issue of how do we gain economic power in a system that has locked us out uh, for for many, many years? And, and, and how does this issue of economic power link to the issue of uh, police brutality and um, uh, a lack of dignity uh, for people of color in this society? Abigail, could you help me? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Gary. And um, it's an honor to be part of this um, panel, and, and particularly in this time. Um, these conversations are needed more than ever. Um, look, this system has been designed to exclude people of color. It, um, you know, we've done two programs uh, around. Uh, scaling Latino-owned business, but that's one piece of the whole picture. Um, we know that 
narrative about who we are in this country, what our potential are as black and brown individuals, and then as black and brown business owners, um, that the whole system is uh, stacked up against us. And that's not to put us into a victimization scenario. It's just that the data has shown it over and over again. And it starts with the starting point. Um, you need wealth and you need equity to get money. My husband is a business owner in construction. And during the last recession, he was going from bank to bank and saying, you have to have money to get money. <laughs> Um, so obviously that's a huge part of it, but uh, through a series of conversations that we've been having with a whole host of business ecosystem leaders and players from philanthropy to entrepreneurs themselves to capital providers and to business support organization, which Gary, you, you've been a part of, narrative is a huge part of the picture, how we're seen um, as contributors or as um, very often how we're portrayed as um, askers as opposed to givers, um, you know, very much impacts uh, what we're able to, to get. Um, when we go to a bank, do they see perhaps that a Latino business that's focused or an app that's focused on healthcare, um, just looking at the demographic shifts would be, you know, an incredible investment. But instead we're seen only as, you know, providers of taco, taco trucks and lawn services, all dignified businesses, of course. But um, just going back to sort of what Stephen was saying about innovation and creativity, um, we have those tools. But if you're not going to hear us and see us, then you're going to miss out on the biggest opportunity, which is black and brown businesses that have been behind the recovery in the last recession and are going to be behind the recovery in this one. And then in terms of how it connects to um, the violence that we've seen, I think it goes back to, can you see our humanity? Um, we have here only stories of violence and crime and gangs. And in the case of Latinos coming here to take jobs from others, as opposed to seeing us as the contributors that we are. So um, I'll just end here and, and allow my colleagues on this panel to, to chime in. But narrative is a huge part of this, and the narrative has to change. And I'm really hopeful at this moment in time. We're at a critical inflection point, and people are saying enough is enough. Things have to change. Uh Oh, Phil, uh, I, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what uh, what uh, your view is on this issue of access and opportunity yeah. for entrepreneurs, particularly entrepreneurs of color. And then uh, you might want to talk about some of the work that you've been engaged in around ensuring uh, that we have an inclusive economy that works for everyone. No, I appreciate it. And um, pleasure being here with all of you and, uh, you know, Abigail at that rang with me because I go back to when I was a kid. I used to go everywhere with my dad when I was a kid and realized we went to the bank a lot, And but we went to different banks. And I said to him when I was a kid, I said, why do we go to so many different banks? And he said, yeah, I'll tell you when you get older. Turns out why we went to so many banks and why it took him four years to get a loan was because of his skin color, was because of the zip code we lived in, was because of his credit score just being a few points too low, not being seen as viable because a narrative, to your point, Abigail, a narrative was different. What has changed now? Not much. And so, you know, it was. it's interesting. One of the things and so many things we've been seeing on TV the last few days, and I believe it was spray painted on one of the buildings in one of the cities. Um, and it said, can you hear us now? Question mark. And being seen and being heard and being included is so important. And too many people have been excluded. And I always say, you know, equity is you can have a you can have a diverse room of people. You can have an inclusive room of people. But it doesn't mean it's equitable. It doesn't mean that everyone has a front seat uh, at the table with equal voice and equal chance. And the systems are just not designed for that. So when it comes to entrepreneurial you know, ecosystems, 
the work that we've been doing at, uh, at Kauffman Foundation is around looking at what does it take for an equitable entrepreneurial ecosystem? You know? And so we've been testing out and, and working with communities on a community-driven approach for building an entrepreneurial ecosystem. And you have to have inclusion, you have to have equity, you have to have every voice represented, you have to understand your social networks and use social capital, utilize social capital that you have as a gift in your community. But you don't necessarily begin these um, entrepreneurial efforts starting with the usual suspects in the room. And we're actually testing out um, in our Eastwick Communities Program and, and select cities across the United States, a deep dive look at how you and how an entrepreneurial ecosystem that's equitable, that's connected, that fosters trust, and that everyone is represented and everyone listens. We're actually testing that out in four cities and following that and evaluating. And then, of course, we'll report out on that so cities across the United States can, can, um, you know, can use that as a roadmap for building their own um, entrepreneurial ecosystems. But, you know, it, it, how many times, I had this question just a couple of days ago and said, can you, can you, can you give us an example of a community that's that's done this right. I said, do you see what's going on in the nation right now? What community has really done this really well? We're in the same, so many communities are in the same spot because of the systemic issues that have not been addressed for a long time. Yes, you know, I'm gonna uh, simply address some of the um, previous questions. Um, we lost Gary because of technical okay. difficulty, so I'll, okay. I'll just go All get right. right into it. There's this longstanding narrative that, that goes something like this, that the conditions of black cities and neighborhoods are a direct result of the individual behaviors of the people living in them. Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, the, the, we have been striving for the American dream, but the American dream has not rewarded those behaviors. A lot of my research centers around housing devaluation, um, where I looked at homes in black neighborhoods and compared the, the home prices um, to those in white neighborhoods. And I controlled for all of the reasons people may suspect homes in black neighborhoods are, are, are priced lower than um, those in white neighborhoods. And we controlled for education, crime, um, walkability, and all those fancy Zillow metrics you see. And, and, and what we found simply astounds that homes in black neighborhoods are devalued by 23%, about 48,000 per home, about 156 billion in, in lost equity amounts to. Now, for the business community, um, that is the money folks use to start businesses, knowing that most businesses are started by um, using the equity um, uh, that is found in people's homes. It's also used to send your kid to college. It's also used by municipalities to, to fund infrastructure and education. It's a big number. It could have funded at least 4 million uh, businesses based on the average startup. Now, that those numbers, that $156 billion, um, was just taken from 2017 alone. Now, we know that wealth begets wealth. We, we've heard that. Um, and all, but it, it also, a lack of wealth compounds other social issues. And so the more you don't have wealth, the more you're likely to go into debt, um, um, suffer from crime um, and reduced housing quality and a number of other factors, including negative health outcomes. I generally say, and you see, if, I don't know if you can see on my T-shirt, that there's nothing wrong with black people that ending racism can't solve. If we truly want to get at um, this um, racial wealth gap and ins ins inspire more business growth, um, we have got to get rid of the, that narrative that Abigail talked about. But we do so by investing in um, the, the homes and businesses in black neighborhoods that have been robbed from the resources because of racism. Another um, 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 uh, study that I did through my, with my Brookings colleagues, and by the way, I want to give a shout out to Jonathan Rothwell of Gallup and David Harshbarger, of, also of Brookings. But we did another study where we scraped Yelp data um, mm -hmm. from businesses all across the country, and we compared 
um, businesses in black neighborhoods with businesses in white neighborhoods. And what we found also astounds that businesses in black communities owned by people of color actually score higher on Yelp, but receive less revenue because of the concentration of blackness around it. So people are less likely to go to that business, but the, the quality of the business is, is, is there. Our elders used to say the phrase, our ice is just as cold, because they knew if you um, bypass the um, quality in a market, you um, you um, distort it in a way that suppresses economic growth. So we have quality homes. We have quality businesses. We have quality neighborhoods. The, the reason why they're suffering is because of a lack of investment. Um, going to the context in which we saw Floyd's death, um, we saw that the evidence pointed to um, um, the black people being stopped by police two and a half times more than the white counterparts. In fact, in, in spite of the fact that we only represented, represent 9% of the total population there. Now, um, that pr certainly predicts for the harassment that people um, receive. Now, but let's look at the economic outcomes. Um, also, black households earn ha less than half of what white households earn in, in um, uh, Minneapolis, um, in St. Paul. And so we should look for the policy precedent, the policy violence that, had, that precipitated um, those outcomes. And clearly that's in um, economic uh, discrimination, job market discrimination, a lack of um, capital for businesses, all of those different things. But the, the point is, we have got to address the policy violence that, um, that, that, that is leveled upon black people in every single day. Um, the, the death of individuals at the hands of the police pales in comparison to the death and harm that unjust policy causes um, all across the country every single day. Not only are people's lives being taken by unjust policing, but thousands and millions of, are, are, are taken um, earlier than they should because education quality is bad, because businesses aren't getting the, what they deserve, because homes aren't getting what they deserve. Mm -hmm. And so let's address this policy violence um, as we uh, deal with these acute um, emergent situations. If we don't deal with the structural racism, when we'll be right back in the same position we were in before, when the next, in, when the next inevitable crisis strikes, we'll be back in the same position talking about the same things. We must address the structural inequalities that leads to um, early, um, early death and other harmful practices. And by the way, that is not coincidence that because of these structures, um, black businesses, only 5% of black businesses receive PPP loan as part of the, the, the recent CARES Act, only 5%. Now, I don't necessarily need to see white only signs to know that they exist. That's the structural racism that is, that's harming black people. Again, there's nothing wrong with with black people that ending racism can't solve. Let's address the structural problems and not keep talking about how violent or wrong black people are in communities. And I don't know Thank if Gary's back on, but uh, Abigail, you might want to pick that up. Yes, I do. Um, first of all, I just want to, as a Latina, express my solidarity with all of our black brothers and sisters in this struggle. And that also leads into the next part of my conversation is that we have to work on these challenges together. Um, we, ha we are facing uh, similar challenges. They're not always as overt. They're not exactly the same at all times. But in terms of the, the economic discrimination and the um, overt or unconscious redlining and other um, putting brown uh, people in cages, separating children. Um, we're both experiencing violence against our bodies and our communities and our families. Um, and so I just want to say that I think one of the 
uh, it may not be the solutions, but certainly what we should be focusing on right now is coming together. And I just start by saying, I stand with you. And for this economic challenge that we're facing, look, you shared, Andre, a lot of um, the challenges that black individuals, families, businesses face regarding just the starting point. Um, but then, you know, look, we're starting businesses, black and brown businesses, at multiples the rest of the population. We're responsible for a large part of the recovery after the last recession. And yet trillions of dollars are being left off the table because our businesses have to stay small because they're starved for capital and markets and know-how and resources. And so I think if we can band together, we'll be stronger. And I think, um, thank you for that, Abigail. I think this, I think that, um, you know, there's the these aggressive policy uh, components that um, Andre mentioned I'm going to go back to something Andre was mentioning regarding investment. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the neighborhoods that I've lived in. You know, there's a, a, you know, a health food store chain that actually closes. I've been following this. Closes when the, a neighborhood changes to a demographic that I believe they think is too much of color. Right. Um, and will not open if they in a, in a neighborhood unless it has a certain demographic. So that's that assumption. That's that narrative of black and brown people cannot afford when they can, cannot, um, do not deserve, do not eat healthy, all of those different things that are out there that are structural conversations and structural uh, constructs that get in the way of investing in neighborhoods that deserve to be to be um, invested in, and you know, from the policy perspective, you know, we just see it as right now we need an aggressive action to create, you know, equal access to the right type of capital, and, and capital is still there. You know, it's it's got, it's got to be a conversation that that that's in the mix, um, especially for female minority, immigrant, rural entrepreneurs, um, and you know, to we say to rebuild better, we need more funding available to to strengthen. Um, you know the financial and and the businesses. So we've um, one thing just from a, a, a grassroots perspective, and you know uh, started a, a coalition called Start Us Up Now. It's a coalition through our America's New Business Plan. Um, that's a bipartisan policy roadmap to support entrepreneurs with recommendations from the federal, state, and and local government level. So it is about um, what are the things that can be done to make um, the conditions better for entrepreneurs, especially for those entrepreneurs from underrepresented populations. And those are the things like opportunity and a level playing field and less tape, less red tape, funding, equal access to the right type of capital everywhere, knowledge, the know-how to start a business, support, the ability to take risks, which every, it's entrepreneurial. And um, entrepreneurism is about taking risks and starting things new. And so, what we're going to do is spur from a grassroots perspective, and there's over 150 organizations in the coalition now, about going to your local, federal, and state policymakers and and having a voice and speaking up and talking about these systemic things that uh, that have to change. You know, Thanks. Philip, um, I'm going to go back to you. I want to ask this a, a question because the um, when the CARES Act was uh, announced and they um, and when we saw the plan to distribute funds you, um, through right. the Treasury to many of the uh, mainstream banks, I immediately um, cringed and I was worried because we know from pre uh, previous disasters or epidemics like in Hurricane Katrina that many of the mainstream banks have uh, have long had negative relationships with black communities. Can you? explain where the fault lines are in banking and, and what we need to shore up in that area to make sure that when you have a federal policy that's trying to reach um, um, all businesses, that that black businesses receive it. So can you just, um, I'll go to Philip and then maybe Abigail can, can yeah. touch that as well. But can you talk about the, those fault lines and, and what we need to do in terms of policy to ensure that black and brown um, businesses get what they deserve? 
I'd like to see, thank you for that. I'd like to see some form of community policy because it's similar we're talking about, it's been in the, in the news lately about law enforcement and communities and the gap there. What about banking and understanding the communities in which they work in? Because uh, that there's a gap. And so the community development financial institutions are, you know, are a different way of looking at that. And like for here in Kansas City, um, we've been working with AltCap which is one of the community development financial institutions that's, that places money into the hands, provides loans into the hands of those that normally don't get it. And we, um, during COVID, uh, we uh, put in um, seed, a seed amount of grant money into uh, um, all cap to spur, which is now probably about, um, about close to $4 million into the overall pool our money being used to help pay down the interest on those loans for these entrepreneurs that need it. So yeah, there have to be creative, different systemic ways for traditional banks to understand communities, understand, here we go with the narrative part again, though, understanding the narrative, or right, what's the what's the paradigm shift that has to, that, that changes the narrative of why communities are, and, and black communities and brown communities are investable um, versus the perception of them not being. What are the structural things that get in the way? How, do, how are banks using the credit system and the credit ratings and the credit score? Like I was telling earlier about my dad, yes. you know, just a few, few credit, you know, uh, points, a few points too low on the credit score. Took him years to get a loan, just and he was an entrepreneur, just trying to start a business. So I'll stop there, Abigail. I know you wanted to chime yeah. in as well. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think from the Latino perspective, there is a great distrust and mistrust in some cases for traditional banks. A lot of uh, Latinos come from countries where the banks closed their doors to them, kept their money, um, you know, interest rates ate away their entire saving. Um, so there's that. And then there's this feeling that you, d you don't want us. There's no effort to reach out, to do outreach. And then we're less transactional, more relational. And so there's a different way of operating. So I just, you know, to echo um, what Philip said, relationships are critical, are really important, and you need to understand the community that you're serving. And any bank that is not looking at the demographic shifts in this country is going to miss out. You don't want to be behind the ball on this. Um, because we are the future, whether you like it or not, <laughs> whether you like it or not, we are becoming a black and brown country um, increasingly. And, and I do not like to use the min minority. We are the emerging majority. So you need, you need to get on this bus now. Uh, but also more on the, you know, on the actual tactics. Um, we've convened, again, this cross-sector group of a lot of traditional banks as well as fintechs and alternative lenders and funders and CDFIs to kind of address this issue of access to capital for minority-owned businesses, and in our case, Latino-owned businesses, to help them to grow and scale, provide more employment, things that are good for the entire country, not just as a charity thing for our community. Um, and so one of the things that came up was how banks can work differently with CDFIs. If you know that the credit box isn't going to work for the clients that are walking in your door, well, a lot of people have talked about loan referral programs and, you know, one of the banks that we've been working with said no one, you know, was there was no uptake on it. It's like, hey, sorry, we don't want you, but why don't you go down the street to this other person? And people were not doing it. So instead, they're trying to explore, can we can we approve this loan and then sell it to the CDFI so that there's never this feeling of breakup? And then when the company graduates later, maybe they'll come back because they had this good experience. And it's just, it's something that happens in the mortgage, um, you know, business all the time. So it's just one tool, one thought. And the other thing is FinTechs and other organizations that, you know, Camino Financial, FinHabits, they're looking at a whole host of other things that aren't just credit scores. And we're, we've got to move beyond credit scores when it comes to working with our black and brown businesses. Because um, we just, just as Andre said, we're not starting from the same starting point. But that doesn't mean that we're any less bankable or that, you know, we can look at receipts. We can look at a whole host of other, um, you know, are you paying your bills? A whole host of other things that prove credit worthiness. <laughs> Can you um, expand on that a little bit more? Because the cr credit scoring is is such a, um, uh, it keeps people out. And we know that wealth begets wealth. And if you can't establish credit, 
um, it's, it's hard to, to get credit. So right. can you just right. put a, a can expand upon that? I know I'll, I'll go to Abigail again and then um, switch back to Philip because that's an, a critical barrier um, to access to capital. I mean, there's not much more that I can say on that. It is a barrier. It is a hindrance. Um, I will tell you that the um, average credit score for uh, a Latino uh, owned business or, excuse me, a Latino business owner is under 600. So, I mean, that's going to be a deal breaker for lots. And, and Latinos are using credit cards to fund, you know, their their businesses. And uh, that makes it very diff difficult to grow and scale. And so, we are putting, as you well said, Andre, a barrier upon some of the most promising businesses that we have out here that are knowledgeable and ready and able to serve the growing communities of this country. And also we know that black and brown businesses don't only work with black and brown businesses. They don't only hire black and brown people. This is about the U.S. economy. Yeah. 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 Philip, have say you seen any kind of demonstrations where alternatives to uh, traditional credit scoring has taken place? Uh, I haven't seen that. One of the things I think is looking at just that what are the alternative methods to providing the capital to almost not almost go around the system, so to speak, knowing that that system, that credit, that credit system is broken. So, you know, we've been listening to these issues for a couple of uh, years. And so we, um, you know, we started about two years ago trying to figure out what what can we do as a foundation. So we convene, we listen to the issues, we work with community of practitioners to understand what they were, all all colors, denominations. And so, one of the things we did last year, we created what's called the Capital Access Lab. So it's or it's something we're testing out. So it's a new national platform that break down barriers and increase access for at least the 83% of entrepreneurs who are not served by venture capital firms or banks. 83% of entrepreneurs don't access venture capital funds or traditional bank loans. And capital, all, of all venture capital goes to about four states, five cities, 75% or more of it does. So there's so many of these entrepreneurs left out. So the goal is to you know spur a formation of new financing mechanisms that deliver, you know, uh, uh, funding to uh, funds to entrepreneurs. So it's focused on on three areas: it's providing investment and capacity building to investment funds that, in turn, provide the new kinds of capital to the entrepreneurs. Uh, which and we we assist the investors and we connect capital providers and other things. So it's something we're testing out as a as a philanthropic foundation to try to. You know, and this is just one of other mechanisms that are out there. But what I'm saying is, is because how much can we, you know, if, if the credit system isn't changing, and how much yeah. to get money to entrepreneurs that duly deserve it? Yeah. Know, did you want to mention uh, something? This is about Gary. I'm back. Welcome back, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we've been proceeding. Been Not, we missed you, but, but we've been uh, <laughs> proceeding. I, I just just to finish it's off that thought leg, um, <laughs> is, you know, that's exactly what we're we're working on on the forum with, for Latino business growth is this whole host of alternative um, yeah. capital resources. And one of the things we did in our last convening was created a capital savanna, which had different types of capital for different types of businesses at different stages. Because, you know, someone who, you know, has a small, let's say, uh, taco truck is not going to be eligible for venture capital, for example. Um, and so we provided this whole set of opportunities um, of different types of capital for different types of businesses and also discussed hybrid capital models. Maybe at one stage, you need, um, you know, equity capital. At another stage, you need venture capital, or maybe you need some combination thereof. And um, and so we we started to try and and lay that out. And the other thing is a lack of information. And I really want to make sure not, uh, to mention this before we conclude this call. We're just finding that so many Latino business owners just don't even know what resources are available to them. And so there was um, a website that was created out of our last convening called Where Latinos Go for Funding or Where Latinos Get Funding.com. And it breaks it down just as we spoke and lays out a, a whole set of opportunities. But we need to find a way to get this information out to people. And, and we all know that just 
plopping up a website and having a listing isn't enough. And so I, I would just argue that is another piece of our ecosystem that needs investment and work. And that is getting the resources, the information and the messages out to the people that need it. Gary, before so, you uh, go, I want to answer my own question that I posed uh, to, yes. the, to, the, uh, to the group. Uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, uh, that was mentioned throughout is just a lack of uh, capital. You know, I think um, everyone agrees that if we really want systemic change, it can't happen without the federal government's help. You know, a lot of what we're talking about in terms of venture capital or um, um, individual uh, endeavors um, from philanthropists or um, philanthropic organizations can help, certainly help. But at the end of the day, you need the federal infusion. And what I was concerned about by the release of the CARES Act, that only $10 million, only $10 million of the $2 trillion bill actually went to the, the minority, the, the agency that serves black and brown people. And that's the Minority MBDA. Development Business Agency. Now, now, only, only that's less than zero 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 one percent of the funds that actually um, going to the agency that actually works with Black and Brown business. Now, with that said, um, the CDF, CDFIs, the small banks, Black-owned banks, Brown banks, serving banks. Um, they really do not have the technical capital as banking has completely shifted um, to a online mode. Um, we don't have the relationships and in those banks, we, we, we don't have that technological capacity. And so from a federal level now, we've got to figure out ways if we're going to in incentivize and provide resources to the big banks, they should lend their technological services to smaller banks. And, and in this process, we've got to find a way to beef up our CDFI capacity, our um, uh, black bank capacity. Um, that, no, again, nothing grows without investment. And so if we're also going to see business grow, um, we, we're going to demand that the institutions that, that serve them also grow and, so, and also receive that investment. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that um, in this conversation, when we're talking about what we can do, that we make sure that we say the federal government has to be a part of this, and they have to fund institutions that are proximate to black and brown people. And so I, I, so that I wanted to throw that in there, yeah. Gary, so you could take it away. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me just say a couple of things. One is thank you, Andre for that, uh, those remarks. Uh, I've been working with a number of black-led CDFIs uh, called the African American uh, uh, Alliance of Black CDFI CF CEOs. And uh, we've been working together, 35 CS, uh, CEOs across the country that are really have built an alliance to actually work together to, to create a renaissance in the black community of access to capital. Uh, part of that has to do with the credit box, meaning what is the credit box that when you go into a bank or you go into another location to get credit, uh, what, what are they evaluating you on? Uh, I'm working on another initiative of expanding black business credit where you have seven CDFIs throughout the country that serve primarily black businesses that have a, a, the lowest lending loss in the country for black owned businesses yet uh, and have figured out how to crack the code. So, so the question of lending to black owned businesses as a higher risk or the, uh, the credit box that the banks are using isn't the right view or the right evaluation in order to fund successful black businesses. But I'd say that's also true for Latino businesses yeah. as well. We've been locked out of the system. So I, 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 uh, I want to make sure that, uh, uh, that I, I'm catching up with the conversation I got dropped from. But this issue of, one, us banding together, because as Steve Barry says no, uh, earlier, that you know, it really is us that has to actually help solve this problem. I agree at the federal government. But I also think the banks have a big role to play uh, 
uh, in ter- the big banks in particular have a big role to play in ensuring that uh, not only black businesses, but low income communities are served well, uh, and many aren't. So, um, Phil, what, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, I, I I agree. And before you came back, Gary, I was talking on the um, our capital access lab and Abigail. We were talking about different forms, different mechanisms um, to get capital to entrepreneurs, and that those type of exploring those type of alternative mechanisms is important concurrently while the conversation with larger banks is going on. And so my thought is, what is and how do we get that conversation going? How do we have it? Who is it? Brings it together, gets us at the table with the larger banks in this moment, and has these conversations. Because I think it, it, obviously the, the time is right, the examples are ripe, are more ripe, and, and I, um, you know, that interdependence theme that um, was talked about er, earlier, and uh, in, a, in a piece I wrote last month on you know how we need to retain our interdependence. And Andre, to your point, it's everybody. We have to be these. We can't. We can no longer have a crisis. You know, we had the Great Recession. You know, nine eleven, whatever it was, with the country rallies together and everyone gets excited, da, da, da. and then we fall back apart. And we fall back apart in this in this in this comfort of thinking, hey, the economy's going up and everything. You know, Dow's going up and economy's getting better. All the while, underneath it all. The same issues are taking place, and the same issues are exacerbating. The inequity is getting larger. And after this one, that we're COVID and the situation we're having right now with um, with injustice playing out, we can no longer go back to the way we did it before. We just can't. And I'm I'm hoping that there are not people that are awake now that maybe weren't awake before, that actually can be good actors. And our good actors can, can be in that conversation. So I, 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 my my excitement here is around getting that, getting the people to the table. And that's you know it's collective to think through that. But uh, that's a that's an answer that I got to that one, Gary. Oh, I want to I want to just oh, add on to that because um, in, particularly during this moment, um, folks are demanding that we address anti-black discrimination. And, um, and, and I think that is critical because anti-black discrimination has led to the subjugation of other groups who are proximate to blackness. And so you see okay. the way um, 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 second, uh, whites treated blacks as second-class citizens in, in policy, the same way we're treating undocumented immigrants in policy. And by the way, also um, uh, brown citizens of, of, of this country, I mean, uh, I mean, the the when the president said told the congresswomen to to go back. I mean, I was absolutely appalled. It symbolized um, the 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 perception of of people of color at, as a whole. But I just want to be clear that the anti-black legislation of the past is reducing everyone's chances at at at, at, at economic growth, including poor white folks. So the re- the, so the, the the folks in rural America who can't get access to capital and and denied um, that access for X Y Z reason are, were the were the reasons given to black people why they can't be get um, 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 get capital and 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 also in terms of labor the reason why the unemployment rate is so low for Latinos but the wages are also low. For Latinos, because they were taking advantage of labor, the devaluation of people, we're being devalued to a labor function. And by the way, the greatest example of that was slavery, where folks were reduced to a labor uh, a, a, a labor function. And so I say that to say, hey, we can all rally behind so an anti-racist, or, um, we can rally behind an anti-racist agenda to eliminate anti-black policy, but to be clear, we are in this together, meaning we need um, our our brown brothers and sisters, um, whether they are citizens or not, because they are in this together with us. We need our Asian American brothers and sisters 
in this struggle. We need white folks um, who are sympathetic to the cause to be in this struggle. Um, it's going to take a coalition of folks, yep. of practitioners, of business owners, of policymakers, of researchers to, to come together and really advance this agenda, or we're going to be back right back in the same position when the next inevitable crisis occurs. You, you couldn't have said it. Oh, go oh, ahead, please, Gary. Please. You couldn't have said it any better, and I, I agree with you 100 percent. And I just want to add um, that I think to do this, we need to start building black and brown wealth. I think we're, yeah. we need all different kinds of power, and one of those powers is exerting wealth, um, developing, building wealth, and then using it to support each other. And so I just wanted to add that on top of what you're saying and also acknowledge our Native American brothers and sisters in this, exactly. too. That's exactly right. I mean, we um, and I, I just did it. We ob obscure uh, our Native brothers and sisters all the time in statistics because we'll, we'll find some lame excuse that we don't have enough <laughs> ends, uh, enough numbers. Um, but, um, you know, categorically, Native Americans have been um, removed from an economy. Let's be clear. And, you know, and, and that's what this is about. Not, you know, with for me, when I look, seeing Floyd being murdered in the street, I say this all the time. There's nothing that says um, black, brown people, Native American people, Asian folks don't belong in the economy than somebody getting killed in the middle of the street by the police. Mm -hmm. Nothing. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's, it symbolizes that. And so we got to connect our social issues with our economic ones because they're one and the same. The same. The way yeah. that mm -hmm. policing are choking out individuals, our policies are choking out businesses and business owners every single day. So we got to connect these dots. It's connected and interrelated. Absolutely. And I, Makes me think of a quote uh, our our founder Ewing Marion Kaufman said years ago, which was, "All the money in the world cannot solve problems unless we work together. And if we work together, there's no problem in the world that can stop us as we seek to develop people to their highest potential." I mean, it's all what you just said. It's every. It's all interrelated. And um, I, I agree with you 100% there, Andre. What you just said, and um, it's it's the work to understand. And bring to light the the interdependence and the interrelation, and um, and to do it together because it's can't be done in silos. Gary, I'm sorry, I may have stepped on you there. I didn't know if you were coming in there. No, 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 not at all. I think you came in at the right time. I mean, you know, so there is pockets, and and Phil, you talked earlier about the ecosystem work, uh, and it's, it got mentioned before. There are pockets pockets of success around the country that are focused on low in, low income communities, uh, micro businesses, developing uh, uh, the JP Morgan Chase program of uh, entrepreneurs of color in, in uh, Detroit and in San Francisco certainly point to uh, potential and opportunity. The issue seems to be that we're not able to scale at the level uh, uh, some of these programs that are working, some of the things you mentioned in your lab, Phil, how do you get to scale with what we're talking about? Yeah. Well, you know, my, our, our, our thesis philosophy is that you uh, economies are local and how do you get tools and resources into the hands of many people that need them to understand how to build an entrepreneurial ecosystem regardless of where they are ge geographically? So I guess ours is more of a grassroots approach and understanding that then uh, and play space of course here in Kansas City um, as opposed to you know a, a, a larger frame type of in investment into just one one city or what have you but but the the thought is that unless you start block by block and sorry here the former community organizers coming out of me now but unless you start block by block and understanding what are your true values of a community? What are your gifts? Don't try to be like Silicon Valley. Don't. Uh, you know, how do I be like this city or this city? What are you true to? What are your gifts? And organize around that and be proud around what that is and then build from that perspective. And we, we see that when that happens, that you know, the most authentic and connected communities um, 
form. Now, you have to, at that point, understand when to integrate in uh, those that have um, resources. We're, we're seeing that happening in Kansas City in one of our communities programs that, that's now started from itself, started from scratch. Now the Better Business Bureau is involved. Other organizations are starting to get involved. And coming in and saying, I never knew there were this many entrepreneurs or entrepreneurial ecosystem builders in Kansas City that are interested in doing this work because it's an untraditional way of going about it. Um, so that's how I, I, I answer that, Gary. I, I, I think it's at least an alternative approach for that we think communities across the across the United States should uh, should um, you know give a try. Gary, can I add to that? You, you know, one of the things that my research does, and, and it's featured in my book, Know Your Price, which is conveniently placed behind me. <laughs> uh, I saw that. Yeah. I saw that. It's called product placement. Well, in the in the book um, th that I talk about how we um, need to invest in the assets in community. Again, no, you know, nothing grows without investment. But no one invests in deficits. No one invests in problems. And you know, the challenge um, for my research community, I work at the Brookings Institution. Um, the the challenge of the Brookings uh, uh, research institutions like Brookings, we're constantly talking about what's wrong with black communities or yeah. Um, yeah. comparing black communities to white communities without the context of structural racism. And, and that relationship is, essentially suggests that black people need to catch up to white people. And so what ends up happening from an investment standpoint, we're constantly investing in white people to fix black people. And so I say, hey, we need to spotlight the assets in black and brown communities, the businesses, the homes, the structures um, that are worthy of investment. And if it were not for racism, we would be investing in them because they're obviously great assets. Um, and so um, I, and I say all that to say how you get to scale ultimately is investments in assets at a, at a at a macro level, that has to occur either at a from a federal or state level. So it's not just about investing in that one business or that one unicorn, as as folks like to say. And that's why I don't necessarily um, rock with the 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 venture capital world as much because that's not going to really take us to the scale that we want to get. It's going to have to come from. Um, a federal or state infusion of cash to individuals mm -hmm. in mass um, who own businesses, who to for people to own homes, um, to invest in ideas and patents um, developed by Black people from a federal level. The, the one of the the dangers of the Care Act, or right before that Care Act was passed, the Department of Labor relaxed the affirmative action policy, and we've been working for. Uh, forever to get at least 5% of all government or federal co contracts to go to yeah. black and brown businesses. And the, in, 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 in a snap, the um, federal government relaxed those affirmative action policies. And so, yes, we've got to identify the assets, but more important, we need a federal infusion or state infusion in, in mass to those businesses, those business owners, those homeowners, those renters, so that we can truly expand our businesses and homes and communities in a way that, that gets to the scale that we, we want and demand and, and, and need. Community Andrew, can I just add to that? I just, I just want to say yes and. Yes, because nobody has as much resources as the federal government to spread around if we can get them to do it. But And I don't trust them to do it So because right. they've disappointed right. us so many times. <laughs> So we're, we're, we got to do it. This. And that's one piece. And I know we'll probably have to end. You're going to cut me off, Gary, and I will let you. But just one thing. We have mm -hmm. to build our black fund and brown fund managers. We have to use that um, millions or trillions of dollars that were discussed before yeah. to start reinvesting in our communities also. Um, and we know best. I have so more I'm to say, give, but Gary, uh, you want me to you want me to Thank stop, you. So I will. <laughs> One, I want to thank everybody, uh, and I want to give uh, Phil a last word on, on that. 
uh, uh, comment about fund managers and what folks are doing in philanthropy around ensuring that we are fully participating. Phil, do you have anything you would want to say to, to close us up? Yeah, I would. I would you know, going back to um, our, our capital access lab and what it's really to you know what we're seeking to collaborate and share knowledge. This is about building a community with other foundations and private investors and others. We've had our alternative capital summit uh, back in January. We'll probably have a have another one. Um, you know, it's collective work around looking at how do we do this do this differently. And I think that you know all the ideas that have come up today, and there's this this theme of interconnectedness and interdependence and movements and being able to understand. I love the part that just where Abigail and and Andre finished on talking about the community wealth aspect of it, right? Because it's about housing, it's about health, it's about education, about all of those things being intertwined to rise up the community and invest in it from a from a from a positivity, from a positivity standpoint. So, um, you know, alternative, call them alternative ways of doing it, but it's, you know, if we, if we go back to over in the history of our communities, we've done this before. We've, we've done this work before and we, uh, we can certainly do it again. Well, I want to thank everybody and uh, a lively discussion. I uh, got cut off, but I want to say, I jumped right back in. Thank you. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot of work to do, folks. Well, we the do. time is now. The time is now to make a difference in the society that we can be a new place where everybody can participate. Uh, we need a society that works equally well for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, panelists, uh, thank you. for all of your talents. And thank you to AEO for having us today. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it.
Hey, folks, Roland Martin here. Glad to join you for this virtual town hall talking about a critical issue that deals with people who are returning citizens coming back into the workforce, but also the opportunity for them to be entrepreneurs. And look, we know a number of different stories out there. You have folks like uh, Chef Jeff Henderson and uh, others, who's a prime example of someone who served time uh, in prison, who comes out, uh, becomes a world-renowned chef, opens his own business. There are many other stories like that, but it still poses... The issue still poses major problems for individuals uh, who are trying to uh, get back into society. So the purpose of this town hall, this conversation, is to really highlight uh, what needs to happen, what rules need to be changed in order to improve uh, the lives of returning citizens and give them a shot at entrepreneurship. All right, folks, let's go ahead and introduce our panel. Joining us right now is Tulane Montgomery, managing partner uh, with New Profit, Robert Boyle, the CEO of uh, Justine Peterson, Lori Bayer, Director of Trauma Training, Community Connections Incorporated. Also joining us is Chad A. Sanders, Operations Manager and Program Coordinator with the First 72 Plus. Teresa Hodge is President and CEO of R3 Score Technologies and Keisha Parikh Wade, owner of She Nailed It. Now, uh, what we're dealing with really is when we talk about returning citizens and the issues they face, we're dealing with public policy. Uh, when President Bill Clinton signed the Welfare Reform Act when he was uh, in office, it limited housing opportunities uh, for folks who, uh, who were formerly incarcerated from living in public housing. It limited individuals from being able to get uh, financial aid. So here you're saying we want you to improve your life, but the problem is if I can't get a loan to go to college, how can I actually do that? And so uh, I, I want to start this off uh, first uh, with, uh, with, with Robert to sort of set the stage for us. Uh, for the people out there who really don't understand how dire it is for returning citizens. Robert, set the stage for us. How difficult is it? Uh, how difficult have we made it for these individuals to be able to re-enter society and especially to, to become entrepreneurs? Yeah, thanks, Roland. Um, if we're speaking about individuals who have recently come out of incarceration, uh, the challenges are, are extreme, as um, our other guests will uh, will agree with, I'm sure. I mean, there's um, uh, coming in, uh, uh, reacquainting with the family, 
Uh, there are housing issues. Uh, there are uh, child support issues that could be lingering. Uh, there's uh, uh, credit issues that, 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 that credit may have been stolen, for example. Uh, that the trauma that Lori is going to speak about, of course, uh, the uh, the lack of network, um, all all sorts of uh, issues that most small business individuals who haven't experienced uh, the justice involved system uh, don't have to think too much about. So the barriers are are huge. Um, it's not to say that. Uh, some of those barriers uh, with uh, a minority of the individuals um, perhaps provide strength. Uh, but those of us who are working in the small business lending world uh, and are working with those individuals who have recently come out of incarceration um, are challenged uh, is that we otherwise aren't. So those are some of the significant barriers to uh, uh, to those individuals who are coming uh, directly from incarceration. Um, T Teresa, we're dealing with in we're dealing with people who are impacted by public policy. Um, share with us again specific uh, barriers. How lawmakers, whether they are city, county, state, federal, have put in place barriers. So on one hand, they talk about ending mass incarceration, but any mass incarceration deals with what happens on the front end. Well, the back end is what do you deal? How, how do you deal with them when they actually come out? Because if you still have an entire apparatus and infrastructure that's set against them, you're going to increase recidivism because bottom line is they don't have the opportunities. Absolutely. Um, first, thank you for having me here and allowing us to talk about kind of my our own experiences. But um, for individuals who go to prison. Once they come home, there are over 55,000 known collateral consequences. Um, and those consequences are barriers. Um, it could be that depending on uh, when you came home and where you came home to, the um, inability to apply for opportunity just because there uh, is that box on an application that says, have you ever been, um, have you ever had a felony um, conviction? And if you have to check that box, that box is a barrier. It means that a um, decision maker, um, an HR person, can actually disqualify you before you even have an opportunity to stand before them. Um, when you look at uh, licensing boards, there are a lot of restrictions that keep a lot of individuals from being able to even start a business. You know, so there's just a tremendous amount of barriers on a federal, a state, and a local level that keeps individuals. Um, feeling like, quite frankly, that they're experiencing perpetual punishment. Chad, the reality is, look, I'm, look, I'm somebody who owns a business. I mean, this is a small business here. Uh, I've got 10 employees. Uh, we're, on, we're on path to do more than a million dollars in revenue, trying to build it. You're trying to sustain it. Uh, and it's not easy. That is certainly the case for somebody who is formerly incarcerated. They got a great idea, but they're still dealing with uh, that trauma. Uh, of the, the internal trauma of what they had to deal with being in prison, but you're still dealing with the trauma now external because how the world still looks at you. And so that, that's still daunting for somebody to deal with all of that, and then we're saying, oh, sure, go ahead and launch a business because the reality is you got to do that because for many people, they won't hire you because you were formerly incarcerated. Absolutely, Roland. Uh, folks that come to the first 72 Plus here in New Orleans, it's very clear. Most of them have been totally excluded from the workforce by virtue of their criminal justice involvement, the nature of the charge, the length of incarceration, and they're starting businesses out of survival. And not only are they trying to survive the basic uh, needs for life, but the fact is they're still dip saddled with the debt and burden of their incarceration. Freedom, unfortunately, isn't free in this country. Secondary, we have the folks that maybe we let back in. They get low-wage jobs, washing dishes in the French Quarter. They pick up landscaping jobs from a trade that they received during their period of incarceration. But they are barely making the ends meet to then hopefully lift themselves and the family out of poverty. Those are the folks that are now trying to create opportunities, side hustles, or leverage the work they're already doing by picking up extra work. And as you stated, uh, if I'm a, a, a Harvard MBA, top of my class, it's hard to run a business. Imagine when you're coming from an underserved community, 
undiagnosed trauma, undiagnosed uh, uh, issues, battling addiction, and the stigma of a uh, criminal background continuing to bear, create barriers for you. So we do it the first 72 plus, and we meet them right where they are. We understand that that foundation needs to be built around financial literacy, access to technology, computer skills and training, such that we give them the fair chance to even engage with financial institutions, lenders and the like in dealing with their customers in a way that they then can have the confidence and hope that this business can help them survive and thrive. Um, Lori, I want to go to you because uh, on, on this issue, uh, we talk about because you, you, have, you have to confront what is the problem and then we deal with obviously the solutions uh, to over overcoming th these particular barriers. Uh, again, I believe the general public has no idea, just no idea what people are dealing with. First of all, a lot of times when you're released or if you're parole, you're coming out, uh, you're not, there are only a certain number of places where you can work. And then typically here you are trying to restart your life and you're likely going to be working alongside a group of whole host of people who are also formerly incarcerated. You may have come from a particular area uh, where it was uh, economically disenfranchised. The reality is when you come out, you're sent back to that area. And so the conditions that created the scenario for you to go in, you're literally coming back, you're coming back in society, walking back into those exact same conditions. That creates a significant problem for somebody who says, man, I got an idea, but wait a minute. I'm living in an area that might be redlined with housing. I'm living in an area where you don't have investment capital. It's likely not going to be a TIF district. It's likely not going to be an opportunity zone. And so, and what I see around me are not a number of other workable businesses. And so how do you, how do you get someone to have these creative fires burning when I'm literally looking at a place that's depressed and I'm now depressed because I'm now back in the situation where I came from? So I think what you're talking about is what we recognize in many of these returning citizens are all these stressors that are added to everything that they're trying to do. And we would also say that it, for some of these people, that is a trauma, that they're, they've experienced trauma in the, uh, in the past in their lives, whether it was physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, whether it was community violence, racism, also the trauma that they experienced during their incarceration, the stressors that they're experiencing as they try to start this business, try to overcome all of those factors. Also, how do they ha then have the resilience? Because what we know is that often those stressors and that trauma, it decreases resilience. So then how do we, as those individuals who are working with them, how do we help to engage them where they're at? How do we recognize that often part of that stress is the feelings of powerlessness that often came from the trauma? I, you know, the, the perpetrator did things to me, the system did things to me. I feel powerless, I don't feel in control. So how do we help them to get back that control and to have that sense of hopefulness and to recognize their own strength and resilience to overcome these factors? Also, we wanna recognize that oftentimes, I think what other speakers have highlighted is how many barriers there are that are put in place often by authority figures. And unfortunately, the stressors and the trauma that they've experienced have been from authority figures. So how do we become an, a, a, a person of a helping person who's still in a position of authority, but someone who recognizes how we can do that with compassion and understanding to, to be able to walk with them? Because I think in trauma-informed care, we always want to be sure that we're never doing things to people or for people, but how are we walking with them to help them overcome this, often the feelings of hopelessness and lack of control so that they can achieve their, those objectives. Keisha, I want to go to you. First and foremost, Keisha, uh, how long were you incarcerated? So I wasn't incarcerated. I'm sorry. Um, I come from a family of um, a lot of incarceration. My brothers, um, aunts, uncles, and I've seen it. I've, I've been um, impacted because I am a... Um, in a family of people who um, have those struggles gotcha. and who come home and they're pretty much lost in the struggle because they don't have the correct resources. And I would like to say that um, a lot of 
um, opportunities aren't there for them. So working in a traditional sense of a, a work environment aren't always allowed to people that um, have been incarcerated. Sorry about so, that. I, I, was, I, was I was told that you were. My apologies there. So let me ask you w w w with that. So you witnessed what it was like for individuals uh, coming out. Of, yes. of your family, of your family members who came out, did any of them want to launch their own businesses? And if they did, what did they, what did they endure? What did they go through? Were any of them successful in actually launching one, or were the barriers too great? The barriers are very great, and um, there have been opportunities um, dealing with the first uh, seventy-two plus for my family members to get in there and just um, entertain the idea of moving forward with a business. Um, sometimes that's not even, uh, when they come out of, of being incarcerated, that's not even a thought. So just to entertain the idea that I could be a business owner, they have been um, extremely helpful in getting um, my family members what they need to becoming successful in today's society, society outside of being incarcerated. The thing that, 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 again, I go back to public policy. And, um, look, you got eight states in this, D D uh, D.C. They're voting today. Uh, they're primaries today. And, 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 and folks always talk about vote, vote, vote. But I don't think the public really understands the role that public policy plays. We make these assumptions that businesses don't want to hire the formerly incarcerated. But when you have, when you have laws that are positioned to prevent folks from doing that, that's really where the fundamental problem is. Anybody can jump in and answer this question, and that is, um, what are some of the most egregious laws that are preventing f uh, the returning citizens from being able to become entrepreneurs? Anyone can jump in. For me, this is Teresa, I think that it's um, a lot of the occupational laws, which are held at the state level and a lot of times, it prevents you from what type of business you could start. Um, that's one thing. Such, such um, as? Such, explain that. So, like, for instance, in some places, well, I know in some states, if you were formerly incarcerated, you can't get a license even to do hair. Exactly. I was going to say, that's one of the ones that's extremely common, um, that you can't um, get a license, and which is interesting because in many prisons, some of the educational opportunities is around cosmetology. And so you can learn to, while you're in prison to be a barber. You can even maybe sit for the exam. But when you come home at the state level, you're denied that opportunity to actually get the license that will allow you to legally, lawfully um, enact that business. So wait, so wait a minute. Hold on, so, hold on, hold on, hold on. So you're telling me you can be in a state facility and cut hair, but when you get out, you can't get a license from the same state to cut hair. Well, the interesting thing is, for a lot of people, they don't serve the time in their particular state. And so, for me, I was in a federal prison. And so, at the federal prison, women were um, at Alderson Prison from all, all around the country. And many of them went and uh, through the cosmetology program. They received a cosmetology license. And then the issue is, when you return back to your community, you have to follow those particular laws. Right, right. And that is just a very one law, but again, that's just one. There is a lot of various laws that are on the books, and it's complicated because it's a state by state level. Tulane, uh, uh, who, uh, when we talk about breaking these barriers down, we're talking about trying to make these changes. Um, are we really confronting more so? The to, to the point that Teresa just said. We're really dealing with a state-by-state -state issue. I think a lot of times what happens is folks say, okay, we need the CBC and we need people in Washington, D.C. to change this. But the reality is, when you look at the incarceration rates in this country, there are 2.3 million people who are incarcerated in the United States. Uh, uh, but the reality is only 10% of those people on the federal level. And so the rest of the folks, the 2 million folks, are literally in local, county, or state jails. And so this is really not, yes, federal plays a role in terms of what laws they make, but this is really what happens on the state level. 
I would agree, Roland, and thank you. It's great to be here with everyone. Um, I would say that whether you're operating at the state level or the federal level, regardless, what we need to put in place and really insist on in our local regions is proximate policy making. And what I mean by that is that we need to insist and create structures that enable people who have been directly impacted by the American legal system to have influence on the design and evaluation of public policies, be they state or federal that one of the main reasons you see so many harmful um, impacts from policy, policy that, to be fair, is well intended at its design, is because the people who are designing policy have no meaningful, consistent, or steady interaction or understanding of the lived experience of the people who they are trying to, in some way, support or provide resources for. Um, who has, again, anyone, and I don't, I don't want this to be a sprinkler head conversation where it's a light question, this person, anyone can jump in, just simply just, uh, and I'll call upon somebody if we step over one another. Uh, but when we talk about entrepreneurship, uh, is there, what data exists to sh that shows uh, the typical areas that formerly incarcerated people uh, go into in terms of creating businesses? Uh, are there three, four, or five, uh, the top three, four, or five, what kind of data can we talk about? Hey, Roland, it's Chad. So, specifically in Louisiana, where uh, Louisiana State Penitentiary, also known as Angola, it brags about its uh, vocational training. In fact, uh, wardens and officers throughout that facility brag that you've got a better education in Angola than you do at a community college in New Orleans, Baton Rouge, Shreveport, and the like. Which, and which, so which, which, which is not something to be really proud of. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Uh, but they, they, there's landscaping, horticulture, there's welding, there's auto mechanic, there's also um, um, pipe fitting and those type of really heavy uh, skilled labor uh, professions. Here's the problem though, Roland. When they get those certifications that we brag about, the guys are released and the young men and women are released, they don't have the money to pay to activate the license. So they're wow. already a step behind. They're dealing with fines and fees, arrearages. And so it is, I mean, they're walking out sometimes with more debt than they did when they went to prison. So, so just the whole time right there. So when you say um, they have this license, just give me a sense of what does it cost for them to then have to uh, pay for that license? Let's say $500. If you have a series of pesticide, horticulture, and landscaping licenses, it may be about $500 to activate those licenses to actually use them in your profession. So, are there entities there in Louisiana uh, or that are national that specifically designed to help formerly incarcerated folks pay that licensing fee to give them a start? Well, the first 72 plus, thankfully, we're here, and we don't always have all the answers, but we try to take folks as we meet them, and we do exactly that. We have uh, direct services dollars. We put money in folks' hands to reduce those barriers to housing, employment, and the like. And then we even have an a, a interest-free loan fund that's a pay-it-forward loan fund where at low cost, no interest, we help supplement the needs in that kind of situation. But to the extent, without our existence and organizations like ours that are just trying to do the very best we can with very limited funds, no, there is no uh, pipeline or program call in place for those individuals to get the, the help they need. You see, Robert, I think right there, that's what we're talking about. That is the issue of access to capital. Before I could even think about opening a business, if I don't even have the dollars to pay for the license, I can't do anything. Yeah, no, you're right about that. Um, in, in fact, there there uh, there is a dearth of uh, organizations that... Uh, that will uh, lend to small business in general, not to mention the small business that is owned by an individual who is uh, recently uh, come out of incarceration. Um, unfortunately, our CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution world, um, hasn't recognized uh, the need uh, to uh, focus uh, its, um, uh, its lending uh, onto uh, those uh, individuals who have either recently uh, uh, come out of incarceration and or in general be justice involved. Um, and, and this is unfortunate. I appreciate AEO for taking uh, leadership in this. Um, however, to Chad's point, uh, there are relatively few organizations um, that will open uh, their lending opportunities to um, uh, to those formerly incarcerated, to those justice involved. I will say, um, and these are, this is in some answer to um, uh, to uh, Lori's uh, 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 maybe rhetorical points. 
Um, I'm going to be very clear about how um, relationship building and, and, and lending go hand in hand. Um, when even small loans are offered to um, any individual, and perhaps especially those who have recently come out of incarceration, um, that activity of lending um, forms a relationship and a bond, um, and that lending attached with some other financial capability opportunities, such as credit building, which may sound insipid because that in itself doesn't may not sound like it does very much, but it's that relationship of, of, of taking ownership uh, of a loan and paying it back in a small way, um, not overburdening the uh, the borrower, uh, but uh, 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 satisfying um, some needs, such as um, a um, uh, payment for a license or some child support uh, 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 lending. Anyone else? Um, may, could I jump in with one just piece in terms of you, you asked about the themes of, of work and entrepreneurship. Right. One sort of area, and this is anecdotal, right? Uh, there's not a study behind this, but anecdotally I can say that there is a whole field of entrepreneurship coming from people who've been incarcerated that is about technology and technological innovation. Mm. Yeah. Because the series of experiences that we've been discussing on this panel don't only yield trauma and struggle, they also yield a distinct set of expertise. And so you have people like Teresa with the R3 score or Marcus Bullock in FlickShop, people who have designed technological platforms that are designed to meet a need that they understand deeply and they take their knowledge and their expertise informed by the experience of incarceration and bring it to bear to bring forth a technological innovation. So I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that some of the entrepreneurship we're seeing is in the field of technology and innovation. Mm -hmm. And if I add to that just a little bit, uh, Tulane, I appreciate you saying that because when we think about um, the in number of individuals who go to prison, we're talking about one in three Americans. And so the concern that I always have is when we paint that person as one individual and when we are looking for um, one solution, which is a one size fit all approach. And I appreciate um, what Robert said about um, the importance of community which also speaks to entrepreneurship for all of us, and especially for individuals who have arrest or conviction records. It, um, it speaks to location, like are the ecosystems in place that will allow you and are they accessible um, for individuals? For me, I served a 70 month federal prison sentence. When I came home from prison, I immediately um, engaged with the ecosystem in the Washington DC area because I knew how, and I knew how to access that. But that's not always um, the case for everyone. And I, so I think that we have to look at how do we make ecosystems more accessible for individuals who have arrest or conviction records. And then also, you know, the work that we're doing, we, uh, for the last several years, we've been working with CDFIs and convening and having conversations, explaining how this is the um, consumer who should be coming to you. And because CDFIs have a more, more community-based understanding of who's in their community, what are the needs, and what we've learned is they're not afraid to um, uh, invest um, and to make loans to individuals with, who have arrest or conviction records. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we built R3 Score. We built R3 Score be specifically birthed out of a need of working with CDFIs, where they were interested in this particular population, but they did not know how to un understand and interpret them. And so that's why new tools are important and proximity is critical. Had I not had the lived experience of incarceration, I would have never built R3 score. Anyone else, uh, anyone else yeah, wants I, to jump in? I just want to, yeah, I just want to add, uh, and thank you for that. I just want to add um, that again, getting back to the CDFIs, I think we have to express our strength um, and our interest uh, in um, developing uh, loan funds uh, for example, those of us who have uh, excellent relationships with banks, and most CDFIs do have excellent relationships with banks, um, there's no reason why we shouldn't approach a bank uh, that uh, may need CRA credit um, to consider uh, a fund for those individuals who are uh, uh, justice involved, who have uh, uh, recently come out of incarceration. I mean, these are relatively simple matters I, I don't want to um, I, 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 I don't I don't want to um, sound uh, as though 
uh, lending is is everything, but it certainly is a be is a beginning, even in a small way. Much of our work um, with many of our small businesses is uh, our step up loans, and and I I think we have to our, those of us who are CDFIs and who can lend, I think we have to express ourselves and be bolder about doing that. Well, I th and again, I think that when when we talk about this issue. Um, we have to look at it from a 360 degree lens. And that is, uh, you have public policy, you have capital, you have your state agencies and their issues, you've got philanthropy. And I think a lot of times what happens, in the, and, and also, again, the point I made a little bit earlier, when we're having a discussion about mass incarceration, it's really only one half of it. So it's really what is really the whole issue of what a person goes through, goes through the system, gets convicted, sent to jail, parole, or serve their time, but you got to deal with the back half. I mean, at, at the end of the day, if you, if you don't deal with the back half, if you don't deal with the rest of their lives, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, then you have the issue. Uh, when you made the point about, you know, you serving uh, time uh, in a federal prison there, uh, Teresa, it was white collar crime. Education plays a role in this, yeah. because if you serve the white collar crime, uh, and, if you, and if you're an educated person, look, you understand the system. But then if you take the folks uh, who are go who are blue collar, folks who didn't go to college, folks who maybe didn't even graduate from high school, but they still have a uh, skill and they want to be able to develop that, you have to contend with that. And so this nation has to do a reset overall in terms of how we confront the fact that we lead the world when it comes to incarceration, but we're only now just dealing with a portion of the problem as opposed to dealing with it holistically, to keep people out, to deal with those who are in, to get those in out early, and now deal with them once they're out. Absolutely. And I, I would agree, Roland. I mean, I think that this moment we're all living in and through, you know, I'm, I'm based in D.C., and, and there's been a lot of things I've seen outside of my window the past 48 hours, right, that are quite painful. Um, and I think that we have had to face that when you marry, I would say, rabid white supremacy with unfettered capitalism, that it is mm -hmm. inevitable that the offspring of that marriage will be the subjugation of a group that you have deemed as other or less. And with that subjugation comes mass incarceration and comes the set of systemic policies and structures that we've been discussing that can make it seem so difficult to shift. But I do believe, and that I'm not naive to the challenges inherent in this, but I do believe that even this panel, this discussion, this forum is evidence that uh, with things falling apart, there truly are opportunities for us to redesign um, the system, and that we have to do that leveraging the proximity and expertise of people who've been impacted by the American legal system. Right now, there aren't a lot of structures that draw on the expertise and knowledge that people like Teresa have to inform our policy. We have to shift that, and it's not hard to do. Um, Lori, I want to bring you uh, in, back in this conversation because, um, Again, I, I, th I think I think I think what still what still jumps out at me to, uh, to the point uh, just made. Um, we must go after. I think again, and again, I keep although I'm in Washington D.C. We really got to be looking at those states it, it, from your perspective, and then anyone else can jump in. Is there any particular state that has really done well? That that that, that who who gets this? And they're more, and 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 they they've had some best practices that we can then look at, study, and model, and then take to other states. Lori, I want to go to you. Then I want to bring in Keisha, and then anybody else who can who can just give some insight on that question. Well, I think some states that have really helped um, uh, agencies and organizations to look holistically at, because I think what you're talking about is that we can't take the individual outside of the context of their lives. But when it's talked about, you know, what is the ecosystem? I think that also, what is the mental health ecosystem? Because what we know is that these stressors and these experiences, that they often cause um, a PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. For other people, it's depression and it's anxiety, it's rage. 
So what are the, who are the states that have addressed it as a holistic concern? And I have worked with certain states who I think are, are really aware of and, and are trying to make sure that this is, these services are available across the, the board for individuals, whether they're returning citizens, whether they're offering services in prisons and in jails. And some of those states that I've the wor worked the most closely with are, are Michigan and also um, uh, Georgia has done a lot. I've done a lot of training in Georgia. Um, and, and I would also open it up to the other panelists to, to also chime in on those states that they have seen. Um, I've also done quite a bit of work in Missouri, and I know that Missouri has worked on this. Um, but what are the other panelists? What has been your experience? Well, Roland, I've had a chance to work with Lori a little bit through AEO with the Endeavor Ready uh, cohort, where through our entrepreneurship program, we wanted to deepen our impact by including trauma-informed care and also credit building. And what was critical to that space is uh, the trauma-informed trauma, trauma -informed care component, trauma empowerment and recovery, an opportunity to address that these individuals who have been traumatized by the system and the discrimination thereafter, they didn't start there. It didn't start there. Many of these folks have such a long history of being a victim or witness of violence, an inherent distrust of institutions and government that has abused them, their parents, their communities. They've seen it all. And so the most important part in Louisiana, while we don't have a whole lot to brag about, we're able to participate with organizations like AEO and get these best practices. And in our little microcosm, we're beginning to see results. Just last week, a, a gentleman who was in a program at a Louisiana State Penitentiary where he received his horticulture license I was able to connect him with the local talk radio station who needed landscaping work. This is his first commercial contract. He's been in our entrepreneurship program now for a couple of years and really built out a strong residential business. But now we had a greater conversation about how do we promote these opportunities? What role does our black entrepreneurs and our returning citizens have as these local economies begin to open up? And so from an equitable standpoint, from figuring out what are real solutions, those top-down policy components, we're going to keep fighting that battle. But what I challenge our local community to do and our local business owners and our folks who are in positions of power to reach backwards and find those individuals that are just like your brother, your uncle, and but the grace of God, any of us could have been in those situations to find opportunities like we were able to create for Terrell last week. And if I add to that, I don't know that there is a state um, that's getting it right. What I will say is there are programs, um, programs like the one that Tulane sits on top of, which is the Unlocked Futures Program, which is a partnership with John Legend, Bank of America, and New Profit. And so there are a lot of um, Philanthropy is getting involved, and they're recognizing the importance of entrepreneurship out of necessity for individuals who have arrest or conviction records. And it doesn't matter if you want to um, open a, a barber shop or you want to do landscaping and or if you have the capacity to do technology. And that was one of the beauties of Unlock Futures. I think it is a model that we can look at because in that particular cohort, there was landscaping businesses, some nonprofits and for-profit tech companies as well, which really begins to demonstrate that um, individuals who have a rest or conviction records have capacity. And all we have to do is invest in them. I do want to say, Teresa, thank you for that. And I do want to say that um, something I wrestle with, and, and I'm uh, here today representing a, a philanthropy, right? Um, and earlier, one of the panelists, uh, not for our discussion, um, but Andre Perry, uh, mm -hmm. talked about that people do not, foundations and individuals and investors don't invest in problems that you know, people invest in solutions, ideas, and where there's a trusting connection and a trusting relationship. And so a thing that I struggle with sometimes is how can we marry trauma-informed practice with an asset frame where we honor and acknowledge and address the impact of trauma for people who've been impacted by the American legal system, but at the same time, we don't define people solely by their trauma because there's a whole, right next to that set of trauma, there is a, a, just an equal, if not stronger, list of expertise and knowledge and assets that philanthropy certainly is working to get better at naming. And I believe we as a society need to get uh, more consistent at recognizing and leveraging. So I, I struggle with the tension between really addressing trauma while also highlighting, leveraging, and under supporting assets. Wonder if anyone has a reaction or thought about that. Anybody, go right ahead. <laughs> uh, I understand that because I know for me, when I have uh, 
had opportunities to um, it, it participate in accelerators and access even venture capital. It was the fact that they, if they had seen me and viewed me only in the trauma that I had experienced, and those were the concerns that were keeping me locked out of the opportunity. And so just like everyone else in this country who has um, trauma experiences, we need to definitely be able to have access to um, the medical resources so that we can deal with our trauma. But when we go to work, what we want to do is to be able to bring our whole selves, our whole experiences. If we're starting businesses, we want to be able to if you know, not have to hide the fact that we have arrest or conviction records, um, but demonstrate who we are today. Um, and we want people to see us. And if we are building businesses that are fundable and or we want to be able to um, access communities so that we can learn and continue to grow. And I think that those things are really important. I have um, been a part of trauma-based communities, um, but I try to keep those two communities separate. And when I go to apply for opportunity, I have to, I find that I have to demonstrate that I don't have all of that trauma in order to make someone comfortable to make an investment in me and an investment in my business. Keisha, I want to bring you in this here. Um, your thoughts on this and also, um, again, when we look at the fact that, look, most people, we talk about small businesses and even major businesses, people hire who they know. And the people who are more likely to hire those who are formerly incarcerated are going to be those who are returning, who were, who were returning citizens. Uh, and just, just so, just share with uh, with us your your thoughts on that, and and really what you see that needs to be done. So, um, as a greater goal of she nailed it, my one of my personal goals is to to give back to those uh, formerly incarcerated, whether it's men or women, who's interested in doing like an apprenticeship program with um, pairing with me in my business, um, doing an apprenticeship program to get them. Um, more uh, relying on themselves and their own talents instead of relying on other people to help them get to where they need to be and just get a, 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 um, a understanding of how to run a business. I think uh, me working in uh, corporate America and HR and payroll, I kind of had a, um, I, hope, I hate to make this about myself, but I kind of had an idea of business, but not the full understanding of what all that goes into um, creating a successful business and how I can use my business to therefore help other people um, do the same things that I'm doing. Um, and maybe people who aren't, um, who doesn't have the resources or even the knowledge just to, to get them in there and let them see if this may be a possibility for them uh, is this something that they can see themselves doing and bring them on and, and just let the cycle continue? Our goal is to do, um, push them to becoming a small business owner, owner um, even if it's not in nail technology, just to put your foot, feet in some type of water um, to help you get above, pretty much. God says somebody else wanted to jump in. Go ahead. In on that. I, I Robert, go ahead. That. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, we were uh, privileged to be part of uh, a three years uh, activity with the uh, Kellogg Foundation and the SBA, Small Business Administration. Uh, and uh, it was uh, really uh, uplifting uh, to know throughout those three years, and th 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 these were um, individuals uh, in St. Louis, Chicago, and, and Detroit. It was pretty amazing to me. Um, the outcome of some of that uh, uh, was that uh, those uh, individuals who uh, had begun businesses and or were in business, and these weren't uh, necessarily individuals who had just come out of incarceration, uh, many have, but not all, and the desire for them uh, to encourage and engage those who um, uh, had come out of incarceration was, was amazing. So there's that community that um, uh, that community spirit, that um, interest in um, um, helping others who had been incarcerated. It was just uh, uplifting and motivating and, 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 full, and I'm full of optimism for that reason uh, in this regard. In, in terms of national entities uh, who are out here um, working with folks, um, somebody's watching. 
where should you be, we, we be pointing people to? Who should they be reaching out to? Somebody's watching right now. They might have family members who are incarcerated. There may be people out there who are, uh, who have, who are, who are, who, are, who have returned home. And so, who should they be reaching out to? What entities? Anybody? Well, Roland, we're proud here in New Orleans to do the work we do with returning citizens. You know, like there's so many projects that are the Innocence Project and folks who are specialized in those who are exonerees. One of the good things about our organization is they were for us, by us, and us helping us. We were founded by formerly incarcerated men who, when we walk through that door, you're going to meet a peer mentor, a support specialist who's not going to ask you why you did it, what did you do, and that qualifies you for certain programming. We build a community that's about accountability, defining your own success, and non judgment and so while we're still a, a pretty uh, upstart uh, uh, outfit here in uh, New Orleans, we would like to continue to partner with and create a network of organizations like ours. Unfortunately, we shouldn't be so novel, but in fact, down here, we're, uh, we're working hard throughout the state to, to make as much impact as we can. I think and this home, the best thing that they can do is find organizations like that in their local community. Um, Returning home, it's about, uh, it's a hyper-local experience. And um, it's important that you find the community that you can connect with. And there are, what I will say is not on a policy level, but on a community service level, there are a lot of really good, well-intended um, community-based organizations that are helping people um, meet whatever their needs are, whether it's housing, employment opportunities, they're doing their very best. And for those who are seeking entrepreneurial opportunities, um, those opportunities um, are a little bit few. And I think that I would just encourage individuals to connect to the local um, ecosystems that exist within just about all communities. Exactly. And I would just add to that that this is a place, Roland, where philanthropy can be very helpful because philanthropy mm -hmm. is often an aggregator of resources. So your community foundation, to Teresa's point about what's the ecosystem in your neighborhood, the community foundation is a great sort of repository of information. Um, New Profit is happy to provide information uh, as we come across organizations and networks and referral systems. But really leverage uh, philanthropy and community foundations in particular to get information about where you can find the local enterprises that are there to support and serve you when you come back home. Well, and I also, I think, is challenging those same um, um, uh, organizations, uh, those nonprofits, to also examine their mission. I go back to the point I made earlier. I think if so much energy is expended on the front end and that you can you ignore the back end, and I, even when we talk about the back end, I think what happens is whenever we have this conversation, Folks talk about, well, uh, being able to get somebody a job or being able to help somebody uh, with education, all critically important. But I think you can't leave out the entrepreneurship piece because when you start looking at the jobs out here, the guy who, um, the guy who owns, a, owns a business and he's, uh, he's done car detail work um, uh, in terms of and it is a mobile business where he basically goes out. And so... Uh, we were talking one day, and, and, and he was specifically saying he would want to create opportunities for individuals who are returning citizens to do that type of work. He said, look, I, I, I don't go through the same type of background checks or I don't go through uh, the same type of or create the same type of barriers. And what has happened is other individuals who worked through him have spun off created their own businesses. When you start looking at, when you're making the point earlier about uh, the skill set, the vocational skills, um, the, these are things that we, st we need. Uh, Keisha, when you talk about uh, doing nails, obviously, you talk about hair, when you talk about plumbing, when you talk about uh, car details, I can tell, tell people all the time, those are jobs you cannot ship overseas to China. That's right. You kind of need them here. And so as we are, and again, we talk about the, t the tech piece as well, so as we are talking about, talking about this, this is where I think also pushing nonprofits, the folks who are funding many of these initiatives, to also revise their strategy to be able to create the, uh, the pools of resources that may be a, a micro loan or may be an opportunity to help somebody to actually get started. Anybody can weigh in on that. I, I love that, Roland. And I will say that one of the things that uh, philanthropy and nonprofits 
that whole ecosystem, the social impact space we need to do is um, start getting right and aligned about our belief system, about where leadership and innovation and talent reside. Um, I don't think that entrepreneurship supports for people who've been incarcerated are going to reach their highest point if they come from a place of charity, right? I do believe- There you go. Right, we really have to just rebuke the charity mindset. I'm gonna go ahead and use the word rebuke today. Um, and we need to really find a way to, again, I'm, I'm on the same, you know, same train here, but we need to be able to recognize and honor assets, talents, and strengths that may not be familiar to sort of mainstream investment criteria or mainstream grant making criteria, that there really is an expansion of our mental models that are that's critical in order for us to do the role in what you just described, uh, which is really support people where they are, but not impose a ceiling on their potential and possibility. And I also think that um, what Robert said, adding to what you just said, Tulane, was a loan fund. A loan fund is needed. Mm -hmm. um, there are funds out here today that support uh, women entrepreneurs, black women, um, men, Latinx, but we do not have a fund that supports the one in three Americans who have an arrest or conviction record, the men and women who have gone to prison, who are turning to entrepreneurship out of necessity, who often create uh, solutions to help even their brothers and sisters and the family members of incarcerated people as well. What we know is only 13% of employers have said that they would hire individuals um, who have an arrest or conviction record. And by that, I mean 13% of employers nationwide have said that they're not opposed to hiring individuals who have an arrest or conviction record. Well, that doesn't leave a lot of room for individuals who have arrest or conviction records. In the last recession, um, individuals who had arrest or conviction records experienced over a 60% unemplo uh, unemployment rate. What we know right now is it is super critical to get money to individuals who have the capacity for entrepreneurship. We need to, um, I, I've had the benefit of doing Unlock Futures and a lot of um, philanthropic programs, but there's not enough money to grow and sustain businesses often um, from programs like that. It is depending on what type of business you create, but it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we have uh, those of us who have the capacity to grow and build big businesses to be able to get the funding that we need because what we know is we will hire other people who have arrest and conviction records. Yeah. And Teresa, I will say uh, on, that uh, at the institutional level... Hold tight one second. Hold tight one. Uh, oh, sorry, Chad, then Robert. Okay. Yeah, and one of the things that we talk a lot about with our entrepreneurs is that you, know, you don't just wake up and put on your entrepreneurship hat. And in fact, for the communities that we know we serve, for the last hundred years, we have an entrepreneurial spirit. We have employed each other and ourselves as a means of survival and upward mobility for as long as folks have been free in this country. So to the extent that an, an, a criminal justice involvement has uh, hampered and impeded some of their abilities to get access to capital, maintain that balance of work and a side hustle, we strip away some of that and truly have a hopeful opportunity mindset. And, and when we have that, that's when we at the First 72 Plus or AEO and other organizations like ours have the ability to go to CDFI traditional banks and other philanthropic organizations and be able to truly brag with confidence about the ingenuity and how successful they are where they are today and what that investment will look like. We, we want to have that same conversation that you have with the uh, venture capital firm would have with another person with a great idea. You can bet on these folks because they're battle tested and they understand yep. what it's like to deal with adversity and continue to press forward. I just want to make sure we add that point, because there is a spirit about the folks that come home from prison or have a criminal background that just doesn't start because they had this interaction with the system. It's hardwired in a lot of these folks to continue to survive. Robert? Yeah, I agree with that, Chad. I, I will say uh, at the institutional level, the uh, Small Business Administration, uh, through its micro lending intermediary program, and this is, uh, there are 160, 180 of us throughout the country, um, we have the ability uh, through the SBA to make uh, loans up to $50,000 um, to those previously incarcerated. So I want to make sure that um, we give that shout out to the SBA. Unfortunately, um, for some of the larger loans, the SBA um, hasn't uh, progressed so far, but certainly uh, among those of us who are micro lenders uh, in the SBA program, um, we have the ability to, um, uh, to make those, um, those loans up to 50000 
Got some questions uh, from folks uh, out here. Uh, let me throw it out. Uh, are there any successful models that unite the micro business ecosystem with other local entities, entities such as churches, community colleges, to provide access to resources that will stabilize returning citizens so they can be empowered to be an entrepreneur? Anybody who wants to take that? I don't know about the uh, at the at the federal or even regional level, but certainly um, uh, CDFIs, ours included, um, have engaged um, church-based investors, individuals in churches and groups of churches, um, to invest into a fund um, that will uh, engage lending to um, those previously incarcerated. So it can be done. I think we have to um, again um, have the audacity to ask. And reach out, um, and have the credibility um, and and the the um, uh, just the honesty um, to engage. As Tulane noted, the philanthropists who uh, may not know where to turn when it comes to uh, this issue. Uh, another question here: How can lenders and tech companies like R three score like R three score engage policymakers to reduce barriers to government loans? insurance, government contracting, supplier diversity opportunities, and other economic resources and opportunities? Yeah. Well, for us, we do that on a regular basis. We work with the CDFI community. Um, I've testified before Congress um, around uh, barriers, removing the box just even from the federal government application. Uh, but there is a burden that's placed on an entrepreneur who has a criminal record, and that is to... Uh, educate everyone around them as well and yeah. that's one of the things that i've taken on but it's it's a burden to be able to do that and to build a business at the same time for us we um i think the importance is for philanthropy um to recognize that um this is a viable uh group of people that are worth investing in uh we need high level uh, accelerators to begin to become more inclusive. The inclusive entrepreneur ecosystem, that is a broad conversation. And we have got to make sure that individuals who have arrested convictions have a seat at that table. I um, reiterate the fact that uh, reentry is hyper local. And so the great work that uh, Justine Peterson is doing and the work that Chad and them are doing, it's, it's a very localized work. But what we need to know is that we have to have more conversations. More people have to come in to this conversation. Funding has to come in. We're talking about over 80 million Americans who have an arrest or conviction record, and many of them are having to turn to entrepreneurship. And where we are today in this post-COVID world, many more people are going to have to turn to entrepreneurship. And as a result of that, funding has to be made available. Um, there's probably not enough CDFIs um, to fund everyone. So we, we're going to have to um, explore other capital. Question, what partnerships exist between mental health care providers and micro business practitioners to address the intersecting traumas of being a returning citizen and a person of color? I think that's a very good question. And I, I do think that there are some of the mental health providers who are uh, making themselves available and really focusing on trauma-informed care and really trying to work with those returning citizens. I know that at the agency where I work, we are working with the two halfway houses here in DC providing mental health care. And part of that mental health care is also trauma-informed care and trying to look at the impact of the incarceration, but also possibly what happened to them beforehand. But also I think what was highlighted before, how important it is to recognize them as a whole person, that we're not going to define them just as a trauma survivor, but we're really gonna put the emphasis on survivor and that you have, um, you have survived, you have been strong, you have been resilient. And how do we look at that strength and resilience and see the bridge skills? That what has gotten you through these experiences, what has gotten you through the incarceration, how can you now use those skills in order to start your own business and in order to see that um, I've gotten through a lot of bad things in my life and I can overcome this also. So I think those bridge skills are very important mm -hmm. and, and those mental health providers and also the, the organizations such as um, the first 72 plus that are willing to reach out to the organizations in those areas and also 
to train their staff so that they can be more aware of the dynamics of trauma. I, I think that that's all of those together is what makes that that real um, supportive ecosystem that that is necessary. Tulane, please define social enterprises and talk about how that can help returning citizens. Sure. So, so you know, we define social enterprises as institutions. They can be for profit or not for profit that have a social impact mission, you know, that are holding themselves accountable to in some way advancing or expanding opportunity or addressing, redressing, resolving and injustice. Um, and so you can be a social enterprise like R3 score, I would define as a social enterprise. It's a, it's an innovative technology platform that is designed to address a gaping inequity in terms of access to employment and um, financial products for people who have been convicted of a felony in the United States. That's an example. Um, and social enterprises, I believe, are essential. Listen, I believe that people like Teresa who are running social enterprises, they are America's problem solvers, right? These are the people who have a deep understanding of the challenge and an innovative solution that they are brave enough and audacious enough to take from idea to institution. So I believe that social enterprises are essential. And if you combine social enterprises that are well-funded with unrestricted capital, with uh, smart policies that are designed with the input of proximate leadership and community, along with for-profit practices that uh, create access to lending products uh, and loan products, there's a lot that we can do to really do systems change. But it does take all of these sectors coming together with a shared macro mission. How can the legal industry and the micro business ecosystem partner to aid returning citizen entrepreneurs in, circum in, in, in uh, uh, navigating um, barriers through the sealing and expungement of records? Yes, I think that may include some of the conversation that's around restorative justice um, in places like Oakland, California. In order to get a, uh, a cannabis dispensary, those folks have had to include a certain percentage ownership or employment of those who have been affected by um, nonviolent uh, drug offenses in the past. Um, that has not yet quite played out. We are still here in the South in Louisiana, and we haven't quite got that advanced, but there are conversations nationally about how you can bring together reducing legal impediments i.e. expungement, ban the box things, but also becoming participatory in these economies and emerging uh, industries where particularly returning citizens can thrive. Teresa, I think you would jump in. Go ahead. Yeah. There, today, there is not a, a clearinghouse, a, a national clearinghouse for expungement. Again, it's a lot of this stuff is just very local, whether it's on a state level, um, there's regions that have a lot of this. But what you're talking about is exactly why a why we need a tech solution from a, a formerly incarcerated person, because they are going to understand all the um, intricacies that are necessary to and all of the barriers that we talked about and why it's important to create a solution. Um, I know of a lot of people who have tried, but the barrier has been the um, inability to access capital. I've been very close to the entrepreneurial ecosystem of individuals who have arrest or conviction records nationwide. I've seen a lot of um, great ideas bubble up, and they have been halted because they just didn't have access to capital, access to the $50,000, access to um, uh, fellowships um, that would cohort-style fellowships that would allow them to have some of the um, money necessary to begin to ideate, to think, to tinker around with a business, and then to be able to uh, attach to the uh, next set of dollars. I think if we want to have a robust um, uh, group of entrepreneurs in this company, in this country rather, we have to look at creating a pipeline. Um, one of the, I think the previous panel was talking about um, the a hybrid. Um, format of accessing capital, a combination of debt capital, equity capital, so that when big ideas are enter, because we have big problems um, in this country when it uh, relates to folks with records, that we have to be able to um, fund those who are closest to the problem, who are able to bring about the solution. Uh, let's see here. What efforts have been made on the policy front with regard to placing a statute of limitations on criminal records being open to the public? on the basis of constitutional law, such as the Eighth Amendment. Anybody? Got no lawyers here, I, know, I don't think so. Anybody? 
Okay. Uh, let's see here. Um, do, 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 do. That's it with the questions. So let's do this here. Let's get uh, final thoughts uh, from each of you. So let's uh, first start with Keisha. Um, my final thoughts is, um, so I hope that we all take um, some things out of, well, a lot of things out of this uh, conversation because we touched on a lot of important subjects. Um, just to open up the conversation about our um, formerly incarcerated uh, individuals starting new businesses is, is something big. So um, for us to, to even be right here right now, um, thinking about the next step for them in, in business and the tools needed to assist them in being, being successful in business is, is a big deal. So um, I would just like to say thank you for um, letting me be a part of the conversation and hearing um, how there is resources available to um, people that we all may know um, because there is a good chance that we all may know someone that's been incarcerated or um, or coming home from being incarcerated and we can help them, um, assist them, do our part to help them be successful in the world and in the community. All right, Keisha Parikh Wade, owner of She Nailed It. We surely appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Uh, let's go to Lori. I want to also thank you for being part of this panel today. I think that the recognition that it's not just uh, for returning citizens, about getting the capital or the, the credit score or the support, but it's also recognizing the experiences that they've been through. And um, how do we take that survival instinct and how do we help them to turn that into the strength and resilience that they need to be able to face these challenges as they go forward? And to also recognize that, again, part of that experience has been that trauma and abuse that they've um, experienced in the past how do we recognize those dynamics and change our services so that we can be more responsive to them so that ultimately they can be more successful? All right, then. Robert Boyle. First of all, uh, Lori, y'all. Lori Byers, she's Director of Trauma Training, Community Connections Incorporated. Robert? Yeah, thanks again for this opportunity. Um, I'm going to reiterate what I said earlier, which is those of us who have the ability um, to lend capital, be purposeful uh, and focused, um, on uh, those individuals and their families um, who have um, returned from incarceration. Uh, and, and again, I, I, I'm uh, echoing uh, each of our panelists here that we do want to engage um, holistically, not um, just uh, focus on the fact that we are engaging an individual who has um, experienced trauma through incarceration, uh, but to look at them as an individual with their assets to Tulane's point. All right, Robert Boyle, CEO, Justine Peterson. All right, folks, let's go to Chad Sanders. Chad, final comments. Look, the future of our economy has to include returning citizens. And the folks like the first 72 plus and, the, and on this panel and so many other folks that are doing this work are clearly closest to the problem, but oftentimes furthest from the resources um, needed to really uh, lift up the communities that we serve. And so what I hope is that this conversation and the ongoing action steps that we create continue to bring an integrated coalition of folks that understand that it's not a black problem, it's not a uh, impoverished problem, it's not a uh, criminal justice problem, it's a people problem, and that we won't move forward without an integrated set of solutions. All right, Chad Sanders, Operations Manager and Program Coordinator for the first 72 plus. Teresa. Yeah, I, um, again, first thank you, Roland, for lending your voice to this conversation and to this topic um, and to AEO for having it. Um, for me, the next big idea could be coming um, out of an American prison. The question is, will we fund it in America? And will we create an ecosystem that is fair and that allow people to move beyond their worst mistake and not punish them for the rest of their lives? And I am hoping that um, as this conversation continues, that CDFIs, banks, um, philanthropy will join hand and will create a loan, a loan fund specifically for individuals who have an arrest or conviction record. Thank you. All right, then. And Teresa Hodge, she's president and CEO of R3 Score Technologies. And closing us out, Tulane. 
All right. Well, thank you, Roland, and thank you, everyone. This has been a really timely conversation. I look forward to more. I would say two things are on my mind. One is that there is no one sector that will be able to turn this broken system around. We need the banking system. We need CDFIs. We need policymakers. We need entrepreneurs. We need philanthropy. And we need some other folks I haven't named because of time. But it really is about a multi-sector coalition of people who are aligned with the mission of creating opportunity and inclusion for people who've been convicted of a felony. And what I will say is that um, I believe deeply and have witnessed directly the power and genius that exists in communities of people who have, after coming through the trauma of incarceration, have decided not only to survive, but to thrive and to serve their community in really powerful ways. Th those are the leaders that I want to stand with, get behind, and support. And so I encourage all of us to let go of the notion that investing in these leaders is higher risk than other investments. It is not. In fact, it's lower risk in many ways because the level of commitment and innovation uh, that you see in these leaders is beyond beyond naming. So I just encourage us to get excited about the leadership and innovation that exists in the community of leadership uh, around Teresa and folks who are like Teresa. Our folks, Tulane Montgomery, she's managing partner for New Profit. All right, folks, I will close it out with these comments here. The reality is this here. Uh, we are a nation that incarcerates far too many people. The reality is we should be changing these laws, not putting people in prison, uh, oftentimes for first time minor offenses, not locking people up for inordinate amounts of time uh, with, with the ability to come out serving 20 and 30 years and not getting a sustainable skill set while they are in prison. For too long in America, we've treated this opportunity of just simply throw them in jail, throw away the key and lock them up and forget about them. We've heard people complain about if they have television or working out or if they have vocational skills. But it's supposed to be rehabilitation. We are supposed to be a nation of second chances. But all too often, that is not our attitude. There should be a national strategy that then leads to state strategies to create opportunities for people who are returning citizens. It only makes sense because they are returning. If we've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars incarcerating people for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, doesn't it make sense to create an America where they are able to come back into society and be a contributor? That also includes giving folks the right to vote. We celebrate Desmond and, Sh and Sheena Mead, what they did in Florida with Amendment 4. That should be happening all across the country. But the opportunity to provide economic opportunities, entrepreneurship opportunities for formerly incarcerated, for the returning citizens, is a major issue and should be a national priority. Folks, it only makes sense. Not just S-E-N-C-E, but also C-E-N-T-S. Hopefully, our policymakers, folks in philanthropy, corporations, will see the need for this and actually step up. Well, toss it right now to Hyacinth uh, Vassal, who has uh, some AEO updates. How you doing? Thank you, Roland. With the support of Capital One, AEO launched its Endeavor Ready initiative to identify solutions needed to successfully prepare returning citizens for entrepreneurship. AEO's Returning Citizen Entrepreneurship enhancing support, increasing opportunities, and deepening success reports explores entrepreneurship as an alternative to wealth creation for returning citizens. And it identifies key strategies to deepen the impact of post-release entrepreneurial training programs that can make the difference between an individual's dream and their reality. So if you have 10 minutes, read the executive summary. Otherwise, read the full report and don't forget to share it with your networks. We also have a toolkit. This toolkit provides easy to use resources for practitioners offering post-release entrepreneurial training for returning citizens. It synthesized key research and findings from AEO's Endeavor Ready pilot to outline key strategies to enhance post-release entrepreneurial training programs. Check it out. And don't forget, share it with your network. Thank you, Roland, and our amazing panelists for that wonderful conversation and town hall. 
And thank you Hyacinth for updating us on all the fantastic work that's going on at AEO to support small businesses across the country. Interested in any of the work that she shared? Go to our website, aeoworks.org. Or if you're in the VIP chat now, our conference team is sending you a link so that you can access the report directly. We'll see you tomorrow again for a wonderful conversation starting at 9 a.m. Eastern. Haven't had a chance to register or want access to that VIP conference app? Well, there's still time. Go to aeoworks.org, select conferences, and register. Lastly, remember to engage us on social media by giving us a like, retweet, or join the discussion by using the hashtag Revitalize Main Street. Until tomorrow, I'm Corey Briscoe, and I leave you with these two questions. How will you show up? What will you do to help small businesses?